Those open book publishers, oh, yeah. which is actually based here in Cambridge, and a group of people will be able to address some of the questions that came up earlier in relation to um, the linking between uh, downloads and then sales of books, which was one of the questions that, you, that came up. Yeah. Yep. So off you go, Rupert. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah, so as Danny said, I'm an economist here um, at Trinity College, uh, but about nine years ago, deeply frustrated with legacy publishing, of s especially of monographs in the humanities and social sciences, a group of us here in Cambridge started up Open Book Publishers just to try and say there's another way to do this. Uh, and so we're a, just very briefly, we're a, we're a non-profit uh, community interest company. Uh, we've now published just over 100 titles uh, and, and I'll, we'll look at some of, the, some of the data and things as we go later on. But I wanted to sort of take a step back a little bit because I think we're in a stage now where what and we've seen with the with the with the com with the conversation and with the the presentation earlier with open humanities press we're in a stage now where academics can communicate with a much broader audience than they were thinking about before we have the technology we have the ability to really engage with a broad global audience about our work we have more university trained people globally than we'd ever had before. So there's more people that we are able to engage with. And in the humanities and social sciences, we're in a position where we're, we're fighting against sciences for why we're relevant. And it's tragic that the best of our work is tied up behind, behind paywalls and be behind poor distribution systems. And that people can't access it because of, uh, frankly, incompetence by our uh, our distributors, the people that we are trusting to distribute our work. Uh, and so that's where I'd like to, to start, is to think about what a book could be. What you, what questions you could be asking yourselves when you're doing your research and you're thinking, I want to bring out a research monograph. What could that book be, rather than being told what it should be? As it, at, so at present, most people think, well, I've got to get a book and I've got to find a publisher and the most prestigious publisher the better and I'll say yes as soon as they say we'll publish the work and I'll be pleased and it'll come up at a book and that is the definition of success and no thought is given quite often to who is actually going to be able to read that work who is going to be engaging with it is this is this actually the group of people that I want to be engaging with it and is this the method by which I want to be engaging with them so now a book can be much, much more than it, than it was 20 years ago when, when we were limited to having, well, maybe a little more than 20, but you know, metal had to be printed, uh, had to be melted and, and things. Uh, now we can do much more and the internet was really designed for this and as far as books are concerned, we've made almost no use of that moving forward. So, so now I just want to think a little bit more broadly, what could a book be? And what are the sort of questions that as a researcher you could be asking about what you're going to do with your long form publication? So here are some of the questions that I, I, I think we can now, now begin to ask. The first is, is, you know, who is your audience? Who do you really want to be engaging with? And this could be more than just the promotion panel or the ref committee. But I think that there's a mentality now that the only reason we write a book is to get my next job and the next only reason to write the one after that is to get promoted. And we've lost a little bit about that. There could actually be people wanting to read this work. So, so who do you want to read the work? And if it goes beyond those two, you've got scholars in your field. Are there professional people outside of that world? Do you want, do you want that once, once they've seen your work on, cons uh, on, the, on the conversation, do you want them to be able to link through and access it in more detail? How do, you, how do you want people to be engaging with it? And where do you want them to be engaging? Do you just want them, the people that are, that are limited to institutions that have bought a copy of the book? Are they the only people that you want to actually have access to your work? Or do you want to be engaging globally? Do you want to be engaging with developing countries and developed countries? Are there particular communities so quite often we've got we've we've published works where 
where uh, in, in, in sociology where you're studying a particular community, you really want that community to be able to engage with the work that you've been doing. And so thinking about who you want, where you want, what are the sorts of people that you want to be engaging with should be part of actually the process coming back about what you want to do with your book. And it's the questions you can be asking somebody who wants to publish the book. Can you engage with those communities? Again, the legacy publishers, I'm not sure, I think our CUP representative has, has, has walked away, but anyway, I'll address them over the video. The, the, the legacy publishers are not providing that information. They are failing to deliver any, any metrics through to academics about what they are doing and who they are engaging and how they are engaging with that community. And, and, and as an author, you should say, come on guys, I want to know who I'm addressing and am I addressing the people that I want to be addressing. Similarly, we can be thinking about how you want to read to in, uh, your readers to engage with the work. Um, so do you want the work to be in a very controlled way? So a printed book is quite a controlled manner. You've got to start and then very few people read it that way, but it's presented in a fairly controlled way. But th things have changed. We don't need to be to, to, for readers to be engaging that way. With digital, we can, we can allow the reader to have much more control about the mechanism with which they work through the book. And you can give them flexible ways of doing that. And we'll see some examples of that shortly. Uh, do you want people to be able to comment on your work, either before or after publication? Do you want their comments to be public or just to you? Do you want to be engaging with these people? Once your work is out there, how do you want to be engaging with your readers moving forward? That's something that can be embedded into the publication and the work. And it's something that you can be thinking about when you're at the point of creating a work. How do you want to be engaging with that work afterwards? Do you want, uh, do you want your readers to be able to edit your work? Social editing, Wikimedia. We've got examples where we've got people who really do want that and we can think about that. Or do you want them just to be able to read the work and comment on the side? Uh, how do you want people to reuse your texts? Do you want your text to be embedded into open education resources? Do you want people to be able to adapt them and put them in other places and in other ways? Do you want people to be able to, 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 to distribute them as course packs? How do, you, how, do you want, what, how do you want people to be able to use this? Uh, and then finally, how are you going to interact with, with, with your primary research material? Do you want to be able to bring people through to the archives? Do you want people to be engaging with your images, with videos, with these sorts of things in ways that are meaningful? And how are you going to bring them and, and the interaction between the underlying research and your own interpretation and research of that is something that you could be thinking about as part of the publication itself. I'm going to keep asking questions, sorry. <coughs> what type of content do you, do you want your publication to provide? Traditionally, a book has had text and images, but there's much more than that now. And all of these things can be embedded into works. Do you want audio files? Do you want videos? Do you want 3D representations of a, of a, of a sculpture so that people can look at it in multiple ways? Do you want interactive programs so that people can, 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 can a actually experiment with and interact with it? All of the technologies for all of those are available. They're there. They can be embedded into books, they can be embedded into e-books. And we, as, as we'll see, we have little QR codes so that you can, you can, if you've got a printed work, you know, it's hard to get audio out of a printed page, but with a little QR code, you just scan it on your phone and you get the audio coming through on your phone. You know, it's doable. And as soon as you think about that, it, you're starting thinking about different ways that you can engage with the reader and conduct your research. Because you can expect the reader to be listening to the audio. You can expect the reader to be engaging with the videos because you've embedded that into your monograph. And so um, uh, different formats. What sort of formats? Do you want people printed, PDF, EPUB, Moby? These are the traditional e-books. But there's lots of other different formats out there as well. Do you want people to interact online? Do you want XML versions? Do you want BitNu is a technology that allows it to be read on mobile telephones in Africa. World Press, you probably know about. Wikitext, do you want it on Wikimedia? Do you want mobile apps? There's huge numbers of different ways that, the, that your work can be engaged with. 
Now, it's not clear that all of those are best for everybody. But these are the sorts of issues that you can be thinking when you're creating your monograph, when you're thinking, how am I doing this work? You've got all those options that are available to you to be thinking about and creating that work. And then finally, I'd like to ask everybody to think about the controls. <laughs> Who's going to control the decisions? You sign that contract with the publisher. You want to be quite clear what it is you're giving away and what it is you want to retain. And, and, and are you going to sign away your copyright? Are you going to give that control of the copyright to somebody else? Um, uh, and, and who is it that you're signing it away to? Uh, what is the nature of the publisher you're engaging with? It is, is it a for-profit publisher? That's fine, but it comes with considerations. Is it a not-for-profit? Uh, what is the nature of the publisher and the person that you're entrusting control and the distribution, some of the distribution decisions too. So don't just say, yes, whoa, I found somebody, yeah? If you'll find one, you'll find more. If the person is, have you got the right one for what you want to do with the research? Okay, so those are the questions. So I, 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 I put them all together there, um, just so that I could say, so what are legacy publishers? How do legacy publishers answering those questions? And I reckon legacy publishers sort of, can do the, 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 well, can't do most of that. So most monograph publishers have not engaged with any of those opportunities. You're left with a books that are only, any, only ever read by promotion panels and ref committees. Scholars in your field don't even get access to those works. So the global lifetime sales of a monograph, this is my, one of the reasons why they probably don't tell you, the global lifetime sales of an academic monograph is around 200 copies. Yeah, 200. Yeah, that's less people than we lecture. <laughs> yeah, you're addressing more people in an average first year lecture than you are in your monograph. Yeah, you, the, you, to say that you're engaging with scholars in your field is nonsense. Uh, so, so that's one thing to, ha to have there. Um, uh, Typically, it's a very controlled print format, text and images, none of these other things that have been around for years. You know, it's not, oh, look, we can just, we've just recently been able to embed a, an audio file into a, digital, uh, into a digital book. We've been able to do that for 20 years, yeah? And these guys say, well, we're experimenting with, you know, come on, get real. Uh, um, uh, so, that, that, you know, they're going to give you a text images, a printed, a hardback. They'll give you a PDF. Well, they won't give it to you. They'll sell it for 60 quid. Um, some of them will have an EPUB and a Mobi, uh, you know, which is a little bit, just a bit of a change of an EPUB. Um, you know, some of them really, really advanced. Well, yeah, you'll be able to get an Amazon Kindle version if you're lucky. All this other stuff, forget about it. Yeah? But it's just... There's free conversion tools that take these things from one to another. You know, it's not... It's not rocket science here. Um, uh, and then, of course, the controls, they're all really still can't get around the fact that they aren't going to be able to control the work moving forward. Uh, so open access is, is deeply, deeply problematic for them because they, the, the fact that they could be giving up copyright. Um, and, you know, our dear, beloved CUP, who, are, you know, they are leading the world in, in, in in, in, in taking legal cases against poor and impoverished universities to protect, to protect author rights of something they've done to stop course packs being used for education for poor people. Thanks. Um, okay, so, uh, how, we, how am I going for time here? I wasn't so watching. Okay. Okay, so, I'll, 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 so, if we're going to take all of these publishing methods, we're going, to, we're going to say, look, we can do all these things. Now, one of the arguments about why do we have monographs in humanities and social sciences is because the book itself is an important part of the research process. You say, look, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to write my book. I'm not quite sure what it's going to say, but I know that I'm going to have a chapter on this and I'm going to do this. And the process of writing the book is an important part of the inquiry process that you undertake. If you, from the start, are thinking, 
I can embed videos. I can embed vid um, audio files. I can, I can have multiple ways of accessing this. If that's part of the process that you engage with, it can change the nature of the research, can change the questions that you ask, can change your whole research methodology. And so by absorbing the fact that you can do more with your output, I think that also means you can do more with your research itself. And it hopefully will open up the potential to be much more um, uh, dynamic, much more, uh, I mean, it's going to open up different research possibilities for you. So identifying and thinking about early, recognizing what you can do in it and embedding it into your whole research approach is something that, you know, really to encourage to think about what can you do with a digital publication. Okay, so I just wanted to have a, a couple of examples, um, uh, just, just, to, just for the sake of it. Here's a couple from, from, um, from Open Book Publishers. There's a couple of our own. So this one here is a, is a, is a um, let's see what happens if I double click on that. Um, actually, I double clicked on it before, so I was pretty sure what would happen. Um, so there it is. Uh, you can see there this is going to our, to our web page. You can read a PDF, HTML. You can download things. Uh, there's lots of, lots of stuff there, including um, some usage stats that we can come back to. Okay, so you can read the PDF um, and you can go through. Uh, I just wanted to show, so this is a book on musicology. Um, you can imagine that music's probably <laughs> going to be important here. Uh, and so, so this is an author who was studying uh, the, the, the um, performance techniques uh, for in, in, in a bunch of performances on, on Bach's uh, solos for violin. So we've got lots and lots of analysis of particular performers earlier and late in their career or different performers. It's a lots of different, different interpretations of the same piece of music. And so what she was able to do was, uh, was embed, actually I opened one up um, earlier, let me just get down into, into here. Um, so you can see, uh, maybe, um, that we've got, we've got here, we've got a musical piece here, uh, we've got um, in the PDF, this would, is, is just embedded into the PDF, so you just link it. In this case here, we've got a link that can go through and, and, and play. Um, and I did that before somewhere. No, I didn't. OK, so let's just link through and play. In this case, it goes through to a YouTube channel because it's online. And I don't know if we've got any music. Have we got music here? Um, it's not clear that anything's playing through. But if we had music, if we had speakers somewhere, um, OK, so this browser doesn't have music, but in Chrome it would. OK, <laughs> believe me, there we go. You can see something's going on there. Um, so you can play that. You can read the, um, uh, you, so there's an, an analysis that's around there. The music is there. And uh, I shouldn't have un unclicked that. But, in so, but the, 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 the whole point is that the text is referring to the particular image. And in some cases, we've got analysis of the music that's following on from the recording and the audio recording there. So you're expecting, you're requiring effectively the reader to interact with uh, both the music and the text. In, uh. So that's one example done below. We've got storytelling in northern Zambia. Uh, you know, you can tell what it's about. Uh, and and in, embedded into that are videos of the storytelling process because it's not just what they say but how they say it, which is important in the analysis. So it's the hand actions, you know, I don't know, maybe even they wave their hands more than I do. But <coughs> the, it's the hand actions, it's the interaction with the audience, which is important. Those are embedded into the book so that people can engage with it. And where do you get the feedback? The feedback in some cases, in this case, the author has received, I, I know of one bit of feedback where people wrote back and said, look, you've misinterpreted that hand gesture. Uh, now that's important. Um, and, and that's good feedback. And they wouldn't be able to do that if they hadn't seen the hand gesture. Uh, and the hand gesture is there because the video is there. Um, so, so you can do better research that way. This book here um, uh, is, is, a, is a bibliography by a, a Professor Emeritus here at Cambridge, um, uh, uh, Professor Tony Cross. Uh, 
who's put together, he's an expert on, on, uh, on, on Russia, especially during the period of the Romanovs, and he's got this huge bibliography uh, of first-hand English language accounts of the Russian Empire over a 300-year period. Uh, so this is every single record that, that this professor is aware of, of, of um, an English language account of the Russian Empire over those periods. It's a huge resource. Uh, but he was aware that he probably hadn't got it all and that there would be more uh, and that, that therefore this would be out of date if he wasn't, if he wasn't, um, uh, uh, wasn't careful. In a few years it would be out of date because some more stuff would be discovered. And so he created a socially edited edition, or we created with him, which is on Wikimedia. So here it is here. So it's a Wikimedia edition of exactly the same work and so we can go through and see see all the work here and if you want to look at the reign of Alexander I. So here we, here we have all of these things, but now people can add things to it. Or as these things become digitalized, you can add links to it. So this is a piece of work that can move forward. So it's not just a printed work that's sitting on a library shelf to get dusted down and people to come back and say, oh look, this guy Tony Cross did quite good stuff back in, you know, um, back in 2016. Uh, uh, Actually, it can be a living online resource right now. Okay. Um, very quickly, um, uh, a couple of other things from other publishers. Punctum Books, this is a fantastic combination of videos and artworks and one thing and another. UCL Press, we'll hear about later. They've got this academic book of the future. It's quite neat because you can change all these sections around. So here's a whole lot of chapters. If you click on these, these things move around. I've got to go quickly. Similar, similarly here, Scalar allows you to travel through the book in multiple different ways. Um, these are both digital, but you could imagine them having a, a printed work edition of them. I don't, we can ask, and, and here is a Media Commons press where the book came out with pre and post commentary on Media Commons and then published by NYU Press afterwards. Um, Huge numbers of academic-led publishers are now coming through, so I just want to add this. There's now a coalition called Radical Open Access, radical under the true sense of the word, you know, thorough and wanting to, wanting to really be fundamental in what we're doing with open access publishing, taking it seriously. Uh, lots of publishers, Open Humanities Press, ourselves, these are all uh, scholar-led publishers that are trying to do things to the best academic with academic focus. This is what we can do in our areas to really engage with digital media and openness. <coughs> uh, so there's a website for them there that I've just got up there. Um, uh, issue quickly about readers, um, because this came up before. We get about 300 online readers per title per month. So if you think of total sales of 200 for the lifetime, that's a couple of orders of magnitude more people engaging with this work. This is, uh, uh, this is a sort of one of these Google plots. So we've had just, just shy of one and a half million people using our site. Um, uh, we've got geographic data, about 600,000 of them. You can see that a lot of them are coming from the UK and the US. You'd sort of expect that. These are high quality academic research books. But the rest of the world is out there. Everybody is engaging from all over the world is, is engaging with these works. Anything white means that we haven't actually had anybody from there. So South Sudan, I guess that. You know, there's a few places where we're, where we're not getting readers, but, uh, but I was very pleased that North Korea is now coloured in. And so, so, uh, so, you know, okay. But, um, uh, but I just wanted to add, that was the general, but if you look at specifics, so here are two books, Oral Literature in Africa. Clearly, this is our most accessed work. This is the work that has the most accesses online. It's had just over 100,000 people reading this work online. Uh, and you can see that the darkest country there is Kenya. So Kenya a accesses that work more than any other country in the world. In fact, Africa, collectively, accesses that more, more than any other continent in the world. So this is a book which is really hitting an African market. It's also hitting other markets as well, but it's doing that. Here's one that Greece might still be free. It's about the Greek War of Independence. And the most accessed country is Greece. Yeah? So 
So what we're saying here is these books are reaching their markets. Uh, and there's lots of people out there that want to read them. And very finally, and I've used up much too much time, but the other guy was short. Um, uh, uh, we, d we did embed a little survey into some, in some of our books to say, you know, who are you? It's not at all representative. We got 600 replies, um, but that's like 2%. <laughs> so, so let's not take too much out of this, but it is something. So 50% of the people who accessed our work said that they were doing it for personal use. These are academic, scholarly, peer-reviewed academic monographs. Half of the people there are reading them for interest because they want to know about oral literature in Africa, not because it's part of their job. 80% um, of our readers had a graduate qualification. Surprise, surprise, these are academic monographs, yeah? But, but there's a lot of people out there that have got academic degrees that we have trained to read these things. Um, and only 20% identified themselves as having an academic position. So of the online readers, the people that are accessing our works online, there's a large number of, there's a whole broad community of people out there who are really interested in what we as scholars are doing and are not getting access to them under the legacy distribution system. Okay, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Well, given that for early career researchers, promotion or job prospects do depend and are kind of quantified by whether or not one manages to publish in a high prestige legacy uh, publication. How do you propose, like, how do you propose to incentivize young researchers, PhDs, postdocs to go through these platforms, which give them less brownie points on the academic job market? Yep. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's two parts of that. There is no doubt that publishing with a well-known legacy publisher um, uh, gets brownie points on, 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 on the ref um, and, and on for promotion um, uh, packages. And the early career people are the most difficult to incentivize. Having said that, there's several things that I think can happen. The first is you're engaging broadly with a much broader community. Stepping forward, your research is going further. It's getting out further you've got a much stronger base to be taking your research on in a career. The second thing is that, the sp well, one of the things I haven't mentioned, but speed of publication, things come out much more quickly uh, in, m in all of those publishing models. Uh, we, it's not several years that you're having to do to, to, to get this out. So it's very possible that over uh, the three or four years following your PhD, you'd be able to get two books out rather than be spending all the time rewriting your PhD, which you know, that's an added plus. Uh, the third thing is, and we've said it, we, so we've got quite a number of young scholars that have come through, um, and, and what we say to them is, you've got to make it clear what you've done. That if you just write a CV line, you know, here's my monograph published by Open Book Publishers, a lot of people won't have heard of it. So, but put more than that. Explain what it is that you've done. You've published this open access. Here are the usage statistics that we're doing for it. This is why you wanted to do it. You, you've got to give the tenure committees a little bit more than one line of a CV. And so we work with young, young, young um, especially uh, early career scholars, to be able to r r report that through. And so, so far, all the early career scholars that we've had have, have all gone on to get tenure can, to get tenure posts. Um, but, you know, in some cases we've worked with them to be able to explain to the tenure board uh, what it is that they've done and why they've done it. And so informing, now, now the nice thing is that academics are used to seeing new information, uh, but you've got to give it to them. And if you just default options say, you know, well, you know who this is, you know, they're not going to know who that is and they're not necessarily going to understand that. So, so we've got several partnerships with universities, including here in Cambridge. So the Conservation Initiative um, is a university initiative. We, we got publishing series with those. 
The World Oral Literature Program is a series that's based in Cambridge and Yale. We've got series with those. Uh, so yes, we do form exactly that, publishing partnerships with university departments and, and uh, um, uh, to, to do exactly that, to be a publishing outlet for them, but also to be able to raise the brand and awareness, to bring focus in. And we'll talk about, I think, later on, the institutional, the role that academic publishers can play at an institutional level is, I think, what Lara's going to be talking about. And, and, and that's, um, uh, but that's, yeah, I mean, we have examples of that. Um, Open Humanities Press does it. Uh, UCL clearly does. Uh, you know, th that's a really important part of, of the focus. And a large number of those, of those publishers on that radical open access list, that's exactly how they got going, was to be an outlet for good quality scholarship from some research community based in a university or in a society. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, especially w when in, in, in flipping, it, flipping it on. I mean, the problem with the impact implication is that they want impact outside of academia. So just saying um, that you've had some citations doesn't, doesn't hang up. But showing that you've got readership and impact beyond the academic, which is some of these uses such, which is the fact that you've got it being picked up by the conversation that's going into policy documents, that you've got DOIs and things that can can pla flag all that. It just raises that impact component that you can l l lay down um, as part of that. Excellent. Okay. Good Cheers. Good. Sorry.